morning. Good morning. Ah, okay. How are you guys? Do you have your first beer already? Uh, the coffee, I meant coffee. <laughs> no? Uh, it's my second time in SQL South <coughs> here. As usual, it's a great pleasure. Uh, kind of nervous, kind of excited. I hope uh, you have at least some positive learnings uh, in the next hour. My name is uh, my name is Ivan. I work for Microsoft. Uh, I've been doing SQL Server for the last I don't know more than ten years, eleven years. Anything that has to do with data. Uh, officially, my title in Microsoft is a, is a Premier Field Engineer. Uh, but I cannot really explain what that, that, that means. Basically, working with data on customers. As usual, those events cannot happen without our sponsors. So again, thanks to them. And let me just tell you what uh, what are my goals. Okay, I need to speak louder. So let me uh, let me tell about the goals of my session. My first goal is not to let the guys here on the comfy chairs fall asleep. Uh, and by doing so, I hope that in the end of the session, you will get uh, to know what the SQL parser can, can do for you, what SQL DOM is, and how can you improve your DevOps and deployment processes, improve, improve your code analysis, static code analysis, and most importantly, if you wish, how can you pretty print your SQL code instead of looking at one large SQL statement that's it, that is unreadable. How many of you have had tasks on, uh, let's say, uh, limiting SQL injection attacks? Or, uh, I don't know, uh, analyzing their code for best practices or worst practices? Have you ever had to do this? Okay, cool. Uh, by the way, I have three, three beers. So I'll ask questions, and when you answer, you get a free pass for a beer. So uh, do you usually get scripts which you need to execute on your production? Uh, and those scripts, of course, are not like two-liners. They're like three, four, five hundred lines. And you want to evaluate them before you run them. Do you often do that? Or do you often provide things to your customers like that? Are you often looking for a where, for a delete clause without the where condition? Yeah. Are you afraid of a truncate statement in a script that says, ah, oh, we're just gonna do some select and then you give us the result? Huh? Have you ever thought about how to fix those? Or how can you can evaluate those? without uh, doing uh, the just a simple search in the text editor or in management studio. Yeah? Cool. So, how the slide deck or how the session is going to be structured? It's going to be demo based. And uh, I will actually share scenarios that my colleagues from the SQL CAT team actually had with different customers. And I'll tell you what their solution was and actually how you can implement it yourself. Everything that I show here is completely free. It's in GitHub, you can download it. Uh, in the end of the session, you also get uh, a GitHub repository link where you find everything that I have to show, plus, I don't know, a ton of more, even, even more materials. So, before we get started with our first scenario, uh, do you know what's always encrypted? Hands. Okay, two, three guys. Four. Question number one. What's the requirement on application layer in order for always encrypted to work? How your code must look like? Can you do dynamic SQL statements, for instance? Come on. I see a lady model in the Exactly. Cool. You're the first one that gets here. So, yes, you have to 
use parameters. But before we get there, let me tell about the scenario. There comes a vendor that's in the oil and gas industry, and they have a product that has been shipped to uh, pretty much, I don't know, probably all the, the customers in the oil and gas industry. And their code has extreme amount of dynamic statements. So this vendor has a new customer, and the new customer says, well, I have to be GDPR compliant, I have to uh, harden the code, I want to be uh, error prone, and I don't want any injection attacks. I want this to happen. So the traditional approach is, OK, you have to go and rewrite all your SQL statements. But can you imagine how much work is that in a legacy application? Have you worked on legacy code? That's, that's like, uh, I don't know. In Bulgaria, we have a metaphor. I don't know how it's going to sound in English. So I won't, uh, I won't give it to you. So what are the options? Or have you ever wondered how can you uh, make your dynamic SQL statements be parameterized before they even hit SQL? Basically, uh, there's this solution. The SQL cat team called it SQL command filters. But it's a solution. It's a piece of code that's right now open source. It's in GitHub. And it is based on the SQL DOM and SQL parser. Do you know what SQL DOM is? DOM. Yay! SQL DOM means SQL Data Object Model. And I have one more. So the last question will be extremely difficult. Before we get there, let's talk about the second scenario that gets fixed with the SQL command filters. You always encrypt it. Just a refresher in order for always encrypted to work. By the way, do I need to tell you what always encrypted is? I want to see hands of how many people have never heard about it. Come on, so if I ask questions, everybody can answer, right? <laughs> so, okay, the essence of always encrypted is that you have in your database ciphertexts, not actual values, and those get encrypted and decrypted on application layer. But in order for the whole thing to work, you need to use parameter parameters in your code. And they have to be driver level parameters. So if your statement does not have them, you can forget about always encrypted. But if you have, a leg if you have some legacy code and you want to fix it, you can actually rewrite automatically your code before you even hit the SQL Server for execution. Uh, again, the SQL command filters. So how this entire thing works? Uh, the crown jewels of the technology is actually the SQL DOM parser. Or this is the, the very same parser that takes every single statement you send to your SQL parsing it, validating it, and pushing it for execution. Uh, the components of a SQL statement or a batch that you send to your SQL server, basically, when it goes to the parser, it's split on different script fragments. When you go through the parser, by default, you get pretty printed statement. This is just a bonus. I mean, whatever kind of SQL you write, you just get it pretty printed, and I will show it to you later on. Once you get all the script fragments, you can generate scripts, you can generate the, the parse tree, you can generate everything that the SQL Server is going to produce later on. And now, the important part, the visitor pattern. Have you heard about the visitor pattern in programming? Uh, here and there I see some nodding. The idea of the visitor pattern is actually decoupling the object from the algorithm that can happen on that object. So you can say, for instance, my object is a TSQL statement, or my object is a SQL Server index, and on, th on this index you can define number of actions. But what those actions actually do, you can leave for post-implementation and uh, additional extension. For instance, 
Uh, for instance, I can say if I see an index rebuild operation, before it hits the execution engine, make it an online operation, for instance. Or if I see a delete statement that doesn't have a where condition, raise an exception and just don't execute it. You can do all those things, and those things are called visitor classes. Uh, on theory, it sounds a bit vague, but I hope you get, you get to, to, to understand it when we hit the demos. As I mentioned, this is the same parser of the SQL, that SQL Server uses. It's just a separate installable, a separate package, a separate library that you can add, and you can do static analysis, and rewrite your code before it hits SQL Server. How do you get started? Uh, first, uh, by the way, I will cover the parser and uh, the SQL DuckFX. DuckFX is uh, the library that supports uh, deployment of backpacks, DuckPacks, uh, traditional DevOps scenarios. Uh, how can you start and how you can obtain the, the DOM parser and DuckFX? Basically by installing Management Studio, SQL Server Data Tools, PowerShell module, pretty much anything that SQL Server works with. So if you have to develop an application and install SQL Server Data Tools, you have it. You can use it. You just reference it in, in, in your code. Uh, how actually does it work? So first of all, you need to define your TSQL fragment. This is actually the piece of code that is going to accept the TSQL statement that you provide. Then you define your visitor. In this case, this is a TSQL batch visitor. So every time we have a batch that goes through the parser, we can do so. What kind of stuff? I'll show you in a bit. And then you explicitly must accept the visitor. Why do you need to do that? Well, so you kind of don't allow anyone else to define uh, like a middleman attack or something like that. You have to explicitly accept the visitor in your, as part of your code. Are you lost right now? Probably, yeah. I was lost the first time I saw this slide there. But then, the demo came. So, uh, the first thing I'm going to show is how actually the parser works. So, I will give you a statement and we will count the first, in the first demo, we will count, the, I will display the, the number, the position number of a semicolon in a TSQL fragment. Counting stuff, basically. Just to show you how, SQL, how the parser recognizes uh, recognizes the statements. So, I, I am going to use a script that looks like uh, let's see how that looks like. I was supposed to open it in advance, but I forgot. Sorry. There it is. So, in this script, I want to hook up a parser and I want to show you how to count the position of the semicolon. So, the first thing is here. I need to define the parser. Uh, do you have any idea why this is, uh, this is saying 130 parser? Yeah, that's related to compatibility level. So this is the parser for which version of SQL Server? 2016, yeah. 140 is for 2017, and then you have 120 for SQL Server 2014, and so on, and so on, and so on. So depending on your target uh, database, you can change the parser. Because, you know, in new parsers, you have new stuff. In old parsers, you have things a bit differently, and so on, and so on. So depending on your target platform, you can choose a different parser to work with. Once you define the parser, you define your TSQL fragment. So, practically, this is the entire code. And then, I will accept my new visitor. And this visitor is doing 
this. It is going through tokens. By the way, in uh, SQL DOM, tokens are recognizable identifiers, like where select, space, uh, comma, semicolon, and stuff like that. And all those, by the way, are defined uh, here. So all the, the tokens, you can see, and their ID. Author, backup, begin, pretty much anything that can be met in the T-SQL statement. This is defined here. So my uh, great algorithm is just going through all the recognized uh, tokens and it will display the position of a semicolon if it meets one. So, I set the breakpoint on uh, <coughs> on the output. So, you can see token nine is a semicolon. If we go back, see you can count them. It's number nine. Then, let me go back. Then the next time it meets a semicolon, it's token twenty and so on, and so on, and so on. So you can see how you can actually ingest an algorithm inside your T-SQL. And this is entirely offline. You are not connected to a SQL server. This is static code analysis. Now, what can you do with this? Can I find delete statements without where conditions? Just like that. Can I find truncate statements? Just like that. And this you don't have to connect to any SQL. You can do this on your laptop or on your dev environment. And you can build a validator that actually do this entire job for you. And there is a sample about it. Let me show it to you. The SQL validation. Very user-friendly application, as you can see, uh, with zero defaults. Uh, like this is a customized uh, uh, icon, you know, uh, and so on and so on. So let's take a script, and the entire validator is actually looking only for select statements. If it meets something that is not a select, it will throw an error. So in my case. It says, okay, that looks okay. Tell me some vicious command that you're afraid of for your production. Outer table. If you don't want to wait anyone to complete the sessions and you can you want to kick everyone else. Whatever. Okay. Let's just go with drop database. Oops. Don't contain something other than select statements. Are you interested to see how, how, how is it implemented? Do you think this code is somehow extremely difficult? Select statement, throw an error. One liner. See? And you don't have to look on every single line of code and see if it's a select or not. Any questions so far? Yeah? Uh, I mean, uh, when we calculate the average, like, uh, we uh, check the critical problems in the SQL or not. This is the code, okay, this is like the framework is fine, but are there any template that cover? Uh, not 
externally available. We have a lot of templates, but those are provided internally as services to our uh, premier customers. We have a separate tool, and if you're interested, I can, I can talk about it later on. But publicly, we don't have anything at this point. Internally, we have defined more than 20, 200 rules that look statically on code and give you different suggestions, but that's a separate topic. So we can discuss it later on. Publicly, not, nothing whatsoever. Uh, but you can easily write your own, you know. I mean, it's as easy as it goes. Now, this is how the parser works. There is, uh, in the links you will get, uh, you will get a repository which is visualizing your script in terms of what kind of tokens, what kind of nodes are met, and so on. It's called DOM Visualizer. So play with it, uh, take a note, play with it, and you will see what kind of things you can actually do on every single level with SQL DOM. The next thing that I want to show you is actually how, can you how, how you can rewrite your statement so you can always encrypt it compliant. So you can, how can you define your T-SQL so, so it has driver level parameters? Uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to show this thing called uh, SQL command filters. It's not a product, it's not distributable, it's just a GitHub repository with several uh, libraries defined and several uh, examples. So, <coughs> I have defined like 22 different statements and you can imagine that this is the statement coming from the application itself. See, it has no parameter, it has no parameters, it is defined and it, this is how it is uh, defined inside the code and it, this, this is how it is pushed to the SQL server. The point is that I need to have this parameterized because the parser needs to recognize, the driver needs to recognize parameters so it can work with always encrypted. How can I do that? Well, the magic is, uh, where's the magic? The magic is here. Uh, sorry. These are the parameters. Basically, I'm taking the statement before it hits SQL. The, the execution engine, I take everything that is part of a where condition because we can recognize a where, uh, a where node, right? You saw the select node counting in, uh, in, the previous, uh, in the previous demo. So the moment you see a where node, you take the parameters, add them to a parameter collection and instead of the, the parameter that says, for instance, like something, 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 instead of something, something, you write at P1, at P2, at P3, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the moment you submit that to SQL Server, now it is parameterized. What you have to do in order to get this working in your production? Just take the code, use it. It's free. The point is, though, that still before every single command execute, you need to, to call the parameterization uh, method. So you can change your code. And this is how it looks like. Uh, where's that? Uh, man, I've lost. Statement. Ah, there it is. The only thing I'm doing is I'm taking my command and before it hits SQL Server, I pass it through the parameterizer. It will do the magic. You can evaluate the code and involve when you go to the office, but let me show you how it actually works. So, value between one and 20. Five. Oh, sorry. Five, okay. So, example number five. This is my original query, select something, something, and this is originally what would have been sent to SQL Server. And when, you, when we pass it through the SQL command filters, this is what we get. Parameter collection with two parameters, an automatically rewritten statement. Now this 
SQL Server can work with always encrypted web. See, as easy as that. So you don't have to rewrite your code. You only have to add reference to that library and call the, 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 the parameterized method just before you call the execute command. Yes, you still have to do it, to do it like 10,000 times if you have 10,000 times command executes in your code. But that's way easier than rewriting your entire logic on generating dynamic SQL statements. Are you actually generating dynamic SQL in your application? No? Are you afraid that someone else is doing it? Do you have systems where you want to have parameters but you are stuck with dynamic SQL and crazy plan cache? You don't admit it, but you do have it. I'm 100% sure. There hasn't been a case where I went to a customer that, uh, that doesn't have at least one application like that. Pure dynamic SQL, no plan reuse whatsoever, extreme amount of issues with the plan cache, and so on and so on. So, this is how command filters work. This is what you can do with SQL DOM and the SQL parser. You just reference it in your product, in, in, your, in your application, you build a simple app and you can do static code analysis. You can ingest additional logic inside your code to do whatever needs to be done. You, define, you can define all kinds of visitors, but of course be careful because with great power comes great responsibility. Where's that quote from? Who said it? Yay! Yes, Spider-Man. Extremely not technical question, but still deserves a beer. <laughs> so, have you ever needed to deploy a backpack or backpack in production? Or you're rolling out your changes with uh, direct script execution in production servers. Mm -hmm. Okay, hands. How many of you know duck packs? Why don't you use them? Or you use them, but you don't want to admit. Now I'll show you how they can. Probably they can. We'll see. So, uh, the next topic, actually let me get back to my slide deck. The next scenario that I want to talk about is a customer of ours that had an issue. The DBAs got recommendation that they need to change their uh, compatibility level to uh, 130. Uh, they needed to change some other things on database level, whatever. And all of a sudden, in a couple of weeks, all those changes were rolled back. And they had no idea how. It turns out that those settings were changed after, after the sprint completed or after their next production deployment. Because on SQL Server Data Tools level, you actually define the properties of the database that you need to have, that those databases need to have after deployment. So if you have defined in your SQL Server Data Tools project that your database must be compatibility level 120 and must be uh, in simple recovery, then there's no power in the world that can, uh, let's say, keep the original production settings before you deploy it, after you deploy your duck pack or pack pack. Uh, the idea here is that if you're using duck packs or backpacks, never change your settings directly on production. And if you do, make sure you make the same settings back to your database project. Have you ever been into such a situation? Have you ever seen the screen? Do you know where to find it? I'll show it in a bit. So, one of the things that can help in that direction is a thing called deployment contributors. 
Deployment contributors are routines or libraries which you write on .NET. And you can supply it to the DACFX library when you deploy your DACPACs or backpacks. It's just like applying additional logic before you deploy it or before you actually build or script uh, anything from your DACPACs or backpacks. One similar example is uh, a large vendor of ours, ISV, who tries to uh, deploy a database. But when they deploy it, they get a message saying that, all right, all right I cannot deploy this because I have duplicate name into, in, in, in the constraints. So it turns out that when they define, their developers define the, the application, they add default constraints without naming them. You can do that in SQL Server. Now, don't ask me why you can do that. But obviously you can. So, you define your constraints, they have all the same names, I mean no name, and still you need to deploy it. What can you do? Well, option number one, rewrite your database application so it can have the names, or define this deployment contributor. The deployment contributor will see that this, this is a constraint and it will create a name for it. And every time it sees a constraint, it will create a new name for it. How does this thing work? Let me quickly show it. So this is the code of whatever I need to deploy. A lot of tables, great name by the way, you can see. Uh, Extremely, uh, extremely well-named uh, nomenclature. Here are some of the constraints have their names. Ooh, I'm out of power. Sorry. Unfortunately, I cannot write code for uh, best practices uh, on checking the power if the power switch is plugged. Anyways, so I have some of my constraints named. Not the best names, but still, I have a name, that differs. But then, I have a portion of the code that says, okay, just add the default, but no name whatsoever. So when SQL Server deploys it, it will add the default name, and that default name will be the same for every single constraint, because it's generated during runtime. So, let me show you how this, how the exact deployment is not really working. I am going to run a PowerShell script that will take, that will take that backpack after I created it and it will try to deploy it. So, while we are waiting, uh, ah, okay, it was quick. So let me show there. Could, but could not create constraint or index, see previous errors. And you can see the code, add constraint, something, something. And this is the error. There is already an object named the same way. So. What can I do? I can define a deployment contributor. The deployment contributor is something that you can pass along to your SQL package. If you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm using import backpack and SQL package to import that backpack. Uh, backpack. And let me drop the database. And see, every time I see, and again, I'm, exp I'm, I'm using visitor class, every time I meet a constraint node, I will evaluate that constraint node. Is it a constraint? And I will create a name for it, if it doesn't already have one. And in this case, I'll just use the df underscore 
auto named underscore and some hybrid. Cool. So during runtime, every time I see a constraint, I'll get a new point and it will be appended to my constraint. So I compile this, I get the DLL, and that DLL I can now reference. It, you have to put it in a special place. You have to use a special name, but still, you define your import options. And you can see the import options in my case is the deployment contributor. That deployment contributor, once executed, will actually do the job without any error. And there it is. I have my database deployed without any error. All the constraints go a name during deployment. What other, what other ideas you have now when you see this? Can you, for instance, create a deployment contributor that checks the best practices for your databases, like compatibility level, uh, uh, let's say, uh, enterprise standards that you have defined for compatibility level recovery model and stuff like that? Can you add those to check and actually stop the deployment? This is how you can work on standardization. The contributors you can have on deployment level, on build level, uh, on just scripting level with SQL package, which I will show next. Any questions so far? Have you worked already? Or your brains are melted? Nah. The next uh, demo that I want to show is related to uh, Again, an application. Let me actually first. You know that in, in, in Azure DB, you can do an alter column as an online operation. Or you always told that it's an online operation and it doesn't block anything. By default, when you do alter column, for instance, you want to add uh, alter table, add a new column or you want to change the type of a column, basically, this is an offline operation. SQL Server has to take a lot of logs in order to produce it. And in order to take the log, you have to wait for all the selects, and after you take the log, all the selects have to wait, or inserts, or whatever. So this is usually something that generates downtime, especially in situations with 24 by 7 operations, or some global operation. Uh, OTP program or whatever. <coughs> so in, in Azure, several weeks ago, we added an option on SQL database that says, okay, you can do online outer count. So I, I won't block anything, but I need to specify it in my code. Great, we release it in Azure. But everything else in, in Microsoft as products is on a different uh, development and release columns. So. Yeah, we release it now in Azure, but in SQL Server Data Tools, we will support it in the next release, uh, which is like a month and a half after that. So, what are you going to do? If you're using DAC packs or SQL package for your DevOps, and your sprints are two weeks uh, long, and you have three deployments until we finally internally fix it, so you can get in the, into the SQL Server Data Tools. In this case, again, you can use deployment contributor. Again, you can define a visitor that every time when it meets a SQL Server outer column statement, if it's not online, make it online. Because while detecting all those things, you can also detect the state of the command. Okay, I detect an online uh, index, uh, I detect an index rebuild command. Is it defined as online? No, make it online. I don't care if my uh, developers know or want to do an online index review, for instance. Or other column, the same. Uh, so this customer of ours, software as a service application, globally operating, they need to make schema changes. Uh, for instance, they need to increase the tax rate uh, precision from, uh, I don't know, 18 digits to 29 digits, for instance. 
How can you do that easily? Well, by default, it's offline operation, as I mentioned. But with SQL package and deployment contributors, you can actually work out. I already showed you a lot of, uh, I already showed you a demo, but basically the deployment contributors, those libraries which you define, you can use with DataFX, SSD deploy, or SQL package. All those three are available as options when you deploy your DACFAX, BACFAX projects or whatever. And you can define and actually uh, enhance those with contributors. Now, the scenario with the online count. So this is how my database looks like now. It's an extremely complex application that has uh, a table called fact sales and a cluster key on that table. As I mentioned, extremely complex, uh, very difficult to implement, and this is how my database looks like. See, my single table. Very important table though. Currently, oops. Currently I have my, where's my tax rate call? Decimal 183. Good. But now I need to change it. If I do it as I'm supposed to do it, and how you usually do it, let's change it to, I don't know. Give me a number. 50. Ah, let's go with 23. Can you assign 50 to a decimal? I'm out of beer questions. But that's an interesting one. Can you? Ah, there goes your homework. <laughs> so you go to your office at, on Monday or during lunch, I don't know, depending on how, uh, how eager you to, are you to find out. But in my case, let's go with tax amount made in 23. I save it, I build my project. <coughs> and now, let's execute it. So, I will script it, just I want to show just the script that SQL Server will generate. Uh, I'm using Sorry. Way better. Now I'm executing the SQL package with the scripting action. So I'm just going to script my deployment. This is my target server name, my local machine. It's 2016. This is my database. And it will take the source DAC pack. So this is my schema, practically. So let me run it. Cool, and this is my deployment script. Take a look. Outer table, outer column, no online whatsoever. Yes, I can easily change it here and run the script. But that will interrupt my normal build of my normal CI CD process, right? Because you don't want to have manual interactions before you build yourself and before you deploy your stuff. So you have to have some kind of an automation. Before I show you how to do that automation, do you think this script will be the same if I decrease the precision? And instead of 18, I put 16 there. What do you think? Instead of defining my decimal here as 23, I make it 16. Do you think I will get the same script generated as when I increase the precision? No. no. What will be the result? It will be converted uh, because this is like a bigger amount and that one will be smaller and in some cases it will check it. So it's not. 
Yeah. Basically, in that case, this is what SQL Server and SQL Package will do is it will create a temporary table, insert everything in it, throw you enough warnings that there might be the data truncation occurring, and, that will re and then it will rename it. And if you have foreign keys and stuff like that, it will disable them and then enable them. So, be careful and please know what kind of script you're targeting and what kind <coughs> of commands you're targeting to be replaced. So, let me show you the contributor. Solution is for not this one. <clears throat> this is my deployment contributor. Uh, there it is. It's a visitor. The moment I, I can detect the state, see? I can detect the state of an operation. And I can say, if that option state is off, please make it on. And this is what I do. And when I run it, again, here, let me just show you how to call a contributor. This is the parameter you need to specify when you deploy your contributors. So you just call SQL package with everything, but just assign additional deployment contributors. And those contributors are the thing you have deployed in your, uh, in your binary folder. This is the DOL that I have written. I am going to script it once more, and I, so, so you can see down. Now let me show you <coughs> the deployment script. See, now I have added automatically with online equals to on. Without having the latest versions, version of data tools or anything else. This you can use for column store indexes because you know the first time we introduced column store indexes in memory OTP and so on and so on and so on, SSDT didn't, didn't know about them whatsoever. And every time you had, uh, let's say, a need to implement a column store index, you had to write a post implementation script to add it to your, to, to your DAC pack deployment whatsoever. <coughs> so, this is how you can work with DACFX and that box. Uh, the last thing that I want to show before we get to the questions, because we still have seven minutes. Oh, by the way, do you want to see some other examples on the parameterization? Give me a number between one and 20. Eight. Eight. See, where contains Something, something, it even parameterizes contain statements. It doesn't have any limitations, see? Another example? One. One? There it is. Even if you have nested selects, you still get to have uh, replacement and get parameters automatically. This can help you in so many cases, especially in performance-related scenarios, I have to say. Uh, okay, let me show you the last thing here. Uh, by the way, when you get the, in the links, the, there are different deployment contributors on create database, location modifier, or uh, Deployment stopping contributors, for instance. So, I want to stop the deployment if uh, some conditions are not met, for instance. All those are available in GitHub, so you can use. Uh, do I have questions to answer there, or I should answer them later? Okay. All right. So, so no questions. Oh, you get everything. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you don't get anything. <laughs>
Please don't say so. Uh, that's going to be embarrassing. But still, I'll be here the whole day so you can ask me as many questions as, as you want. I hope to, uh, to be able to help. Uh, I mentioned uh, about this uh, Dax Dome Visualizer. Uh, let me try and find it. Script on visualizer. So pretty much, you can enter any kind of SQL statement. Let's go with just this one. And then you can see max depth is seven. Uh, come on. Control. I pressed it. Okay. Incorrect instance near. Ah. Uh, and the parser do, does not know anything about online on out account. Anyways, this is because we're using an old parser, I suppose, and it's still not updated. You see the effect of the parser not knowing the latest improvements. I mean, when I had the, the online on option, it didn't recognize it at all. And it was throwing an error. And this is what your SQL server will throw if it's an older version. Right now, I just gave it a simple script. And you can evaluate all those different statements that you have. And on all those different levels, you can define a visitor and you can decide what if you want to do anything on that. Do you want to count your select statements, for instance, because you want to get some, I don't know, uh, crazy statistics when you want to show off that you can build 4,000 selects in a single script, for instance? Or uh, are you going to use a masking function? Or you want to evaluate in your entire code base where you're using parameters and where you're not. You can see the tree, the tokens, on which basis are they? And this is actually the logic we are using when we evaluate those code best practices. We run through your database code, and the moment we see that you have something that is not by best practice, we can actually give you the place where that best practice is not met, and the line number where we met that worst practice, or that bad attempt of doing something. And you can build it on your own. You don't have to implement some sophisticated logic. You just have to traverse through the tree and decide what you want to look for. <coughs> As a summary, with SQL DOM parser and tag effects and deployment contributors, you can dramatically increase the quality of your code, the downtime for your applications, and definitely can uh, improve your application code and improving it and giving it option for your applications to use the latest and greatest features for SQL Server. Because this parameter level drivers is something that has been a showstopper, big time showstopper for always encrypted. Now you don't have it. So it doesn't get much easier than that. Honestly. Uh, the slide deck is already published in the agenda. Uh, there you will have the link to the demos and all the repositories. Uh, those are just my copies with the things that I edited. Uh, they are for uh, original locations of all those demos that I showed you are uh, on the GitHub page. You have the links. Additional repositories, additional materials, if you want to dig deeper into that. And just a fun fact, this thing has been out since 2008. Have you ever heard about it until now? Are you going to use it from now on? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Thanks again to our sponsors. And any questions? Yeah? Uh, for data snapshots. Data um, snapshot. 
No, uh, because it's not uh, it's not running during runtime. It is working before you submit anything to your SQL Server. So it doesn't really know what kind of data you're working against. So if I understood you your question. You have the snapshot file, right? Mm -hmm. So you can just ask on the, can we ask on the snapshot file? Oh, oh uh, <coughs> no, no, that you have to do it uh, either with a deployment contributor. I'm not, I'm not sure you, if, if you can, but if you can, it should be there as a built deployment, built contributor, not deployment contributor. And if not, it should be something like a, a pre-execution script or something like that. Because you can add, as part of your DAC5 deployment, such thing. I mean, in SQL package and in build, in uh, SSDP, you can add pre-script, uh, pre-execution scripts. So if not build contributor, you can use scripts for snapshotting. Okay, any other questions? You get everything right, okay. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.